Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome to the deep dive into public data access. Please be advised that your microphones and cameras are disabled by default. If you have any questions or comments during the event, please use the Q&A function, which is located at the bottom of your screen. Thank you all for attending today. I will now be turning it over to our facilitator, Mike Paglione. The floor is yours, so please begin when you are ready. Thank you, Cindy. Uh, thanks everybody for attending. We have a really great uh, webinar set up for you today. This is a joint exercise uh, initiative between the Technical Center in New Jersey and CAMI in, in Oklahoma City. Uh, we started this off in a, a webinar in April called Library Services for Researchers, which included about five speakers, librarians from both CAMI and the Technical Technical Center participated, as well as the Law Library and Headquarters, as well as the two uh, librarians from, from the National Transportation Library. And one of them is going to speak today. Because it was so successful on that first one in April, we, we had both the DOT librarians come back for, de for deeper dives in the last two weeks. So last week, Mary Moulton spoke about library services from, from the National Transportation Library for a full hour. And today we have Leighton Christensen, who's gonna talk about public data access. Uh, with that, I'm gonna hand this over to my colleague and partner in crime, Dr. Anthony Tiverianis from, from CAMI, and he's gonna give you an overview of, of the whole initiative. And then uh, I'll introduce Leighton to start the talk. Okay, and then thank you, Mike. Yeah, it's a privilege to uh, get to see the uh, DOT librarians again and, and listen. And I know I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to this presentation. Um, this is, as, as Mike mentioned, our third presentation on, on research library services, and maybe we can, um, maybe it's not just the third. Um, these events <laughs> are being brought to you uh, through a collaborative initiative um, between the Tech Center and the Civil Aerospace Medical Institute. Uh, both organizations uh, are working in aviation safety research. Both have the same challenges, um, knowledge management, knowledge transition. Uh, and this is a great opportunity for us to pool resources, collectively learn, um, and, and develop enterprise level solutions. So we focused on you know, knowledge management and learning what tools we have out there with regards to libraries. Um, we're now learning about the public data, DOT public access policy, um, which is really about being uh, good stewards of open science. Um, and then we're looking on how we transition our, our projects and products out and get them to the aviation ecosystem. So the public access piece is definitely a part of it, but the others are um, where do we go to a, a kind of a next generation virtual uh, storefront for our products. And so uh, things under this initiative are potentially a new website um, that starts to allow us to, to transition our, our knowledge outputs and then growing to a place where we can transition knowledge into a place where we can start to collaborate with others in the, the research and aviation ecosystem. Um, and so with that, I'm not going to take up any more time because I, I want to hear about public access. So let me introduce Leighton. Leighton Christensen has been a data curator from the National Transportation Library for the past five years. Leighton's position was also created specifically to provide leadership around implementation of the U.S. Department of Transportation Public Access Policy. Leighton is currently serving as the OSTR rd &T Planning Team Public Access Implementation Working Group Chair. That's a mouthful, but I, I do attend some of those meetings and he has quite a job. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of modes in the DOT and he, he pulls them all together for this very important mission. In that role, Leighton is overseeing the update of public access plan and creating a training and implementation set of modules to, for all the modes. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Leighton to, to um, talk about public data access. Um, if you do have questions, as Cindy stated, put them in the Q&A box. There's certain points in the presentation that will break away and, and address your questions. So with that, Leighton, it's all yours. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Anthony. All right, so I'm going to share my screen. And I believe you are all seeing the cover slide. Yes. Excellent, thanks. So the slides are shared. 
the cat's been fed, the plumber has promised not to come before four o'clock. So we can get started with little interruptions unless the helicopters fly by, because I do live in Washington, DC, the nesting ground for um, helicopters in this country. So once again, thanks to Mike and Anthony for inviting me to speak to you all today. Um, today, I'm gonna to give a much more in-depth exploration of the US DOT public access policy than I gave um, a month ago. I'm gonna put it in some context and I hope to have time to offer some steps we can take towards implementation of public access. But first, I wanna take a moment to remind ourselves of the definition of public access. Public access is a very simple concept and, and, to, and Anthony alluded to this prior, you know, previously that this is part of the open science movement. Um, but by public access, we mean that the people of the United States and the computer network world actually are able to discover and access US government funded research outputs such as reports and data sets while still protecting privacy and security. So public access is simply the practice of a more deliberate research transparency. Uh, in recent years, this concept has been applied to research data as well as to research reports that we have been sharing for decades. So, you know, keep that little definition in mind and um, we'll go forward into the presentation. Um, today, I'm gonna talk, well, okay, here we're gonna do some expectation setting, all right. There is way more information in this slide deck than we're gonna get through today. I'm gonna say that right now. Um, very fortunately, when Mike goes to share these slides with you after the presentation, I have included in the speaker notes section of my PowerPoint slides, all of my scripted material and all of the language that's on the slide. And for some slides, more in-depth um, information beyond that. So this slide deck can actually sort of be read by you, giving you the full context that you need. I don't actually need to present this. I like to do that. Um, and it's not just because I look pretty on camera, but um, you know, I, I am here to, to present this to you and have a discussion with you, but you can read these without me. So what we're gonna do today is we're gonna take a very quick review of the April presentation, do that very quickly. We're gonna spend most of our time, if not all of our time on part two, which is the deep dive into the public access plan. If we get to part three, where we're talking a little bit, we're taking that a step beyond in the implementation, tools and practices, I will, I will be excited by that. I do not expect to get to step four where we're talking about data management and data science. I throw that in there because I know Mike's excited about data science and I'm trying to get him to invite me back for another talk. Um, and I think he'll like that and then he'll, he'll invite me back. So with those sorts of expectations in mind, we're gonna take our time. We're gonna focus on the public access plan as promised today. And if we get, if we get more great and if we don't, that's okay, you have the material in front of you. So quick review of um, the presentation in April. What did we talk about? We talked about where public access comes from. It comes in part from the open science movement. That's a global movement. It comes in part from changes to US federal policy in response to and wanting to be part of um, that open science movement. What do we mean by public access? Again, that very simple def definition. The public is aware of and can locate and analyze research outputs. Now that definition has transformed over the years. It went from technical reports as it basically was and research documents for over a century um, since the 1860s um, to where now we're including digital data sets. And starting this year, um, we're gonna start including software and code. Um, and that's gonna be in the updated public access plan. Um, and then I showed you a few resources. I showed you the um, public access plan guidance web page, uh, web website and, and its suite of pages. Um, and as you can see, um, I've included the, the links and the digital object identifying links to all of those things so that you can go out and take a look um, for yourself as well. Um, and with that, let's go ahead and really start to dig in to the public access plan because that's why we're all here. So consistent with federal laws and policies, as we discussed in April, in December 2015, the US DOT published its public access plan um, in order to affirm and enhance DOT's commitment to public access um, to scientific research results, um, and doing this without charge to the maximum extent possible, to making it free to the public. I mean, the taxpayers have already paid for it. Why would we charge them again? That's not our business model. That's what scholarly journals do. Oh, whoop, sorry, that was, a, that was an opinion. I'm gonna mark that one as an opinion. So and then we'll move on. 
This plan, um, our public access plan went into effect on the 1st of January, 2016 to ensure um, public access to publications and digital data sets arising from DOT managed research and developed programs and development programs. Um, a further goal was to scale up the sharing of research that has already been going on from the DOT and many of its research units um, for decades. Um, we've been sharing documents, reports, um, all of that for decades and decades, whether in print or PDF. Um, and then recently, uh, some modes, some offices have already been sharing, sharing their data because there's real um, use and interest in it beyond our offices, right? Um, the public wants it, industry wants it, transportation um, planners want it. So there's, there's a lot of reasons to share our data. So for this next several minutes, I'm gonna step through the various sections of the plan. I'll highlight specific texts, and then I will answer questions that you all submitted to me ahead of time. So thank you for those of you who um, submitted those ahead of time, appreciate that. Now I know in preparation for um, today's session that most of you have spent the last month studying the plan in depth so that when you came in here, you were all ready for me with all your questions all written out and everything like that. And I appreciate all of those all of those of you who did that homework ahead of time. Um, and however, for the rest of you, um, you still, you may find it useful. And those of you who have done your homework may also find it useful to open up the um, public access plan, have that PDF next to you if you have more than one screen. Um, I have three. And um, so you can refer to it if you need it. Other, and the link to the public access plan is at the top of this slide. The DOI is up there at the top of the slide. Um, and if Somebody wants to stick that in the chat for me, I'd sure appreciate it. Okay, so let's talk about, we're gonna skip section one, purpose, simple. We already talked about the purpose of the plan. Let's, let's go into section two, which is the scope. Um, the scope of the plan is fairly short, includes a, a short scoping note and several definitions. Um, the important thing here in the scope note is that all DOT operating administrations and secretarial offices are to adhere to the policies that make up the backbone of the DOT public access plan. And those are listed here um, on the slide and in the text in the, in the slides when you get them. Our plan is in fact built around those laws. And I've provided links to those uh, in the slides so that you can find them. Oops, back up. Um, and, um, And of course, with the updated public access policy, that's gonna mean an update to that list of um, laws that apply to our public access to include things like the Open Government Data Act, which was signed in, in, in 2019. So as I mentioned before, section two also includes a number of definitions. So let's start with the definition of digital data sets. Now, because this is a talk about policy, there's not a lot of pretty pictures to show you, right? This, there's a lot of text. You're gonna see a lot of text on the slides. I'm going to try not to read the slides, I promise that, but some slides I will actually have to spend a little time um, and, and read them to you so that we're talking about the same thing. Um, so I am going to take a moment to read this definition because I think it's important and we had a question about it. So digital data sets for the purposes of this plan are defined as scientific data collected through research project funded either fully or partially, fully or partially, by federal funds awarded through a DOT contract, grant, or other agreement, or collected by DOT employees. Such scientific data are the digitally recorded factual materials resulting from research that is necessary to validate research findings. Okay, so if you parse that definition carefully, <laughs> you can see that, you know, it answers a lot of questions that we typically get for people. Um, and one of those questions is, you know, who does this apply to? If there's a penny of DOT funding in a research project, um, those digital data sets are part of the public access plan. So keep that in mind. Um, the last sentence gives a partial uh, answer to the very common question, um, what is data? It's the factual materials necessary to validate research findings. Um, and the definition of public access says that, you know, continues to go on to say that, you know, the public has the right to access the data unless specifically precluded by privacy, confidentiality, or national and homeland security concerns. Whereas we can come up with other methods to give people partial access or restricted access. So 
we all know that a lot of data gets collected in a research project and it doesn't get used in the final research results. And this plan specifically scopes the required data so that the subs so that we're talking about the subset which validates the research findings. Um, but still, despite um, the language. Now, to be fair, I read this every week and I have done so for five years, so I, I know what's in the plan fairly well. Um, you all haven't, and that's okay. Uh, we still get off, very often questions asked such as the question we got in the mail this week, what is and what is not data, and how much data are we supposed to share? So we've already talked about data being the digitally recorded factual materials. Okay, what's not digital data? lab notebooks, preliminary analyses, drafts of papers, plans for future research, communications with colleagues, and for this um, definition, physical objects such as laboratory specimens, because of course we're talking about sharing digital data. That's what the, the focus of the Holdren memo and um, the DOT public access plan is about. If you have physical samples, you should be preserving those as well, because you don't know when those will be useful down the road, but that's a whole different discussion. How much data do you have to share? Again, it's that subset of the data which specifically backs up the analysis or claims you make in your research paper, your research findings. Unless, and this is, this is a big uh, unless, and this part isn't in the, in the plan, you are recording a very, very unique event that would be hard to replicate, or there's obvious long-term interest to transportation research. Um, so I take as an example here, the 100 car naturalistic driving study um, done in cooperation between NHTSA and Virginia Tech and a couple other players back starting in 2012. Um, that huge data set, that, that, that tens of thousands of hours, hundreds of thousands of hours of, of video and other sensor data sits in a secure room at Virginia Tech um, with limited access. Um, but we want to keep that, we want to keep that all of that forever because we don't know. Because one of the things you can find out about um, find out about the world from all of that video, from those hundreds of thousands of hours of video, is you can find out changes of, of the, about the environment, you know, like what's going on outside of, beyond the range of the, of the faces of the driver, but what's going on in the world, right? Data often gets used in ways we don't plan, and that's part of the reason we want to keep it. So that was a big question right off the bat, uh, and I have promised Mike that a couple of different times during the presentation, we will stop for questions if the audience has any. So Mike, I'm gonna turn it over to you to let me know if there's any questions. So far, there are no questions. And I think it's because you answered that question so thoroughly and, <laughs> and, and masterfully, uh, which is a very important question. What is data and what's the inclusion of data? And I think I think you've really kind of laid it out there. It's, it's the data that you need to validate the results. It's not all the data the data that you need to, to validate the results and kind of like the last set of data that that you need for the scientific method to to replicate the experiment you know so that makes a lot of sense to me um, but again if anybody has questions you can post them and we will we will hit them along the way here so there was uh, one hand raised i saw oh <clears throat> i can't not sure how to address the hand raise. Um, can you? The put person who's got their hand raised, maybe type their chat and the, their question in the Q and A, and we'll, there will be another break, so we can come back to it. Yeah, please. If if, if you don't mind, because I, I do want to get through these this next section a little more quickly than I did the first section, because then we get into section seven, and that's a big long one. So. Oh, uh, oh, oh, here's the question. It's a good okay, question good. too. Uh, what about funded research that doesn't get published? It's still funded, but what do you think, like? We have the right to whatever comes, whatever research results are generated. So just because something isn't published doesn't mean research results aren't generated. You could have generated the fact that the hypothesis that was tested is null. It is, we're not gonna report on it because we disproved the thing, right? That's research results. DOT and the taxpayers have paid for it and we own it with you, with the researcher. Um, and I'll get into the, the fuzziness of um, joint copyright later on in the presentation, but we have a right to it. And another question just came in. Is someone available that can help on a case by case basis to establish what is data or what should be included in, in, in these type of questions? Like the fine line of the definition in terms of raw versus validate results. Is there anybody that can 
Is it you, Lightning, or is there somebody on staff that could could help people when they have these questions? I yeah, I'm I'm happy to consult with people. I think also that each mode needs to develop a culture and some expertise and some decision making about okay, we're funding this particular project or we're performing this particular project, and as we're doing our data management planning, as we're preparing the project, we're thinking about what data is going to come out the other end, and is it going to be the kind of data that we're going to want to save all of the raw data because it's going to have big impact, or is it the kind of research where, well, we really only need to focus on that final research data set because we're, we're trying to answer a very fine, a fine pointed question, right? And so there, the, none of these, almost none of my answers are, there's a quick dividing line and it's, it's good on one side, it's bad on the other. There's a lot of nuance in this, which is why we have to develop at every mode data stewards and data stewardship and data management practices so people start to think um, in terms of managing data and where that line um, lies. Because I don't know your subject matter in the same way that you do. I don't know your research um, community in the same way you do. Um, so you might have a better sense, but then I might be thinking about, so what's the longer term value or value beyond transportation? And so we can have a discussion about where that line gets drawn. It's a team effort. It's a, it's a team sport, data management. Yep, yep. I, I hear you 100%. And by the way, there's now we're starting to hit a bunch of questions. Why don't right, you go move. on and, and, let, and then we'll, we'll hit them in the next round. Excellent. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate that. And thanks, everybody, for getting those questions. And I, I, I'm glad to hear. Um, that means we'll have another session. I'm, I'm really looking forward to spending more time with you all. All right. So we're going we're gonna to breeze through section three, four, and six a little more quickly. We're going to skip section five. Um, Section three is on applicability. So the DOT public access plan is applicable to all DOT employees and all awardees from non-DOT organizations under DOT grant, contract, or other agreement. Boom, done, that question is answered. There's no fine, there, there, there's no nuance here. There's no fuzziness here. Um, if you're getting money from DOT to do research, whether you work here or whether you work somewhere else, you have to comply with the plan. End of discussion. I'm going to move on on that one. Um, so looking at, at, at section four, which is about um, management or requirements, or it includes publication, includes data, includes research records. I'm going to look at the data requirements section here. Um, there are six digital data set requirements. Um, and the two I'm going to focus on are points number three and points number six on the slide. Um, number three is because most people don't don't read carefully enough to pick this one out. Plus this section, this section is bulleted on my slide, but it's two paragraphs in the public access plan all matched together. So you can't see the different requirements in the same way that I've broken them out here for you, excuse me. So DOT will allow the inclusion of appropriate costs for data management and access in funding proposals. Okay, two things. That means the burden is on the researchers to ask a DOT for the money to put the data in a repository before the project starts, which means they have to do their homework and talk to their institution if they're at a university or one of the other fine repositories that we um, recommend because they're conformant with our policy um, ahead of time on what storage is gonna cost for their expected size of data. And DOT will cover that for up to five years. Um, and so that, and the second thing was besides you have to plan for it in advance is we will cover it, right? We want the data saved. We will pay for it. DOT will pay for it. So have your researchers ask for the money. Um, and we can talk about what's a reasonable um, amount, amount of money another time. The second uh, thing I wanna talk about is point six, which is all research fund um, proposals must include a data management plan. Now, Data management plan, we've got a nice template up on the website. Um, you will see the links in the box on the left-hand side of the slide, creating DMPs. You click on that DOI, you go to that DOI, um, you can see um, our guidance and our template for what a, what a two to three page initial proposal level DMP looks like. Um, and it, it communicates to us as the funder that the researcher takes seriously um, the preservation of our data and sharing it with the public and has given some thought to these important questions, such as what repository am I going to use? 
how am I going to preserve it? Or is there a reason this data shouldn't be preserved? And what's that justification? Because you have to give us that as well. And we will take that, but you have to give it to us up front. You can't tell us afterward, oh no, the data can't be saved. That has to be agreed on up front. So now moving on to the next part, um, that, raised, that raised an obvious question. Is there a checklist of criteria associated with the value of a data set to be shared? Would it, would it be of value to anyone else versus the cost associated with curating and making the data set accessible? Um, that was the question as it was translated to me from a verbal um, exchange. So if that seems a little um, out, out, of, out of whack, the, you know, it's, it's fourth hand. So, um, but I get the gist of the question. Is it easy to say that data is not gonna be of value later in its lifetime? The answer is no. There is no checklist and there should not be a checklist. And the reason for that is we don't know now what we're not going to now five, what we're not going to know five or 10 years in the future, right? We don't know the value of data collected today down the road because it hasn't been collected yet, right? You can't prejudge your project and its usefulness um, during the planning stage. You don't know that. Um, so, and tack onto that, the US government and the open science movement believe it is better, in fact, to spend some resources now preserving data at least in, in the short to medium term um, 5, 10, 15 years, and then make a value judgment later on that, okay, this turned out not to be very useful. Nobody else is using it. Um, we can go ahead and we can flush it um, because we need to make space for something that is valuable. But we, we have made that decision rather than mourn the loss of data that suddenly turned out to be useful because we have the next pandemic. We have, um, you know, temperatures warm up more than we thought and every piece of asphalt in the United States becomes liquid again and just runs, right? There's things we don't know um, that are gonna happen in time and we can't plan for that. Um, over time, however, curatorial staff and stakeholders can make decisions about uh, decommissioning data based on that use. And finally, to underline this, the Open Government Data Act section 356, 3562B the US government and its data are open by default. We are required by law to plan to share the data unless of course, there's national security or privacy concerns, right? So um, just get used to the idea that you're gonna share your data um, and let's start planning for it. And then um, we can talk about size and need and, and usefulness down the road. All right, moving away from that. Roles and responsibilities. So. Everybody involved in research um, at DOT has some sort of responsibility here, whether you're in the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Research and Technology, whether you're at an operating administration or secretarial office, whether you're a researcher um, or an institution, or whether you're the principal investigator. So um, you'll see this list is longer in the policy, in the plan, but I highlighted just a few bullets here. It's up to um, OST to implement um, to coordinate implementation of this plan with the operating administrations. The operating administrations and offices will include the requirements of this plan as terms and conditions in grants and contracts and funding agreements. So it's your job to let your researchers know that we have this policy along with, you know, the very many other policies that we let people know that we operate under in the federal government as Mary mentioned in her presentation last week and back in April, um, you know, the um, Americans with Disabilities Act section 508. Um, the, you know, the, or as somebody asked in an email, um, the plain language requirements, right? So there's, there's plenty of um, laws and policies that we operate under in order to make information and data more accessible. And um, it's our job in our contracting um, and grant um, documents to make sure that the researchers know about those. Um, awardees in their institutions have to make sure that they're sub-awardees because they often subcontract research know about the public access plan and principal investigators. And this is where I wanted to, I touched on this a second ago. I want to get back to this. And this is, this is a big issue, especially if you're going to um, put, um, if you're a researcher who's going to publish in a scholarly journal, besides giving your, you know, your technical report, which is a very different animal than a scholarly journal article to DOT, principal investigators must, and I'm going to say this slowly, ensure that all rights under copyright are non-exclusively retained by DOT and that the terms and conditions of publication do not impair the obligation of the authors 
to comply with the DOT public access plan. So this is a big deal because <laughs> authors don't always read the contracts that they sign with publishers. They don't always check, especially if they're at an academic institution, they don't always check with their legal department before they go and they sign things off um, and they sign it and they give away DOT's rights to the um, peer reviewed manuscript of research that the public has funded. Yes, scholarly journals make their money by taking research that the public has funded and then turn around and they sell those papers and those results back to the public. That's how they make their money. But the federal government and the DOT require that we get the peer reviewed manuscript and that our rights are protected because we funded that research. So this is very important and you're gonna get a lot of pushback from your scholar, from your institutional or university researchers on this. Um, and we have an IP lawyer here at headquarters who we're happy to have them talk to if they need help understanding this. Um, now, you know, all of this training, all of these things help us work together to um, share our, our, our DOT research. And one of the, one of the issues that we've been having, um, and, and here I am talking to you about a policy that's five and a half years old now, um, is that we haven't always had the resources to do all the implementation and follow through work that we've wanted to do. But now as a team, um, we, we try to work together, we try to take the, those steps to move forward. So that's, that's why we're talking about some of these things that, um, um, and being very, and I wanna be very clear about them because they've come up now for five and a half years. And so you all get the benefit of things that we've learned for a while. So with that in mind, I wanna pause for another question break for anything over sections three, four, or six. So uh, on that last topic, I actually have a question. So, so, so what you're saying is, is translate that into uh, like practical terms. We have a grant with a, with a uh, researcher at an academic institution and they produce a conference paper or a journal paper as a result of that funded research from the FAA. They are required to follow that rule that you just stated which means we need to get that manuscript. It doesn't mean the final publication that's going to be in the journal, but the manuscript and be able to share it and have it be accessible. I think that's what you're saying, right? Is that the- that's, Yes, that's exactly right, Mike. The best way to think about that is what is the last word version of the document the, the researcher turned into the journal with their final corrections and everything else? What's that last word document? Because we want that, that's the manuscript. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that if the researchers alert us that they're going to have that they're going to publish in a journal, um, they have an automatic if they request it, they have to request it, but there's an automatic 12 month grant of embargo on that um, uh, manuscript if they choose to enforce that right. So we will hold the manuscript in dark archive until the year after the publication date of the paper in the journal and then we will make that manuscript publicly available um, and free back to the public. So if they choose, they don't have to go and pay the price to um, access the journal copy, but we will hold it for 12 months. Does that help? Yep, that's excellent. And, and that applies to our own researchers publishing as well. You know, so right. it, it covers both. Um, we do have plenty of questions here. So, so one of them um, is kind of related to this legal questions. Uh, it's, it's, future use of data that's not covered well in our current consent forms, would that future use violate the consent forms? Um, in other words, does, does, the law, does this law change how we currently um, consent or, or, or you know, sign our contracts in terms of data access? We need to, we need to incorporate this in our, in our contracts or in our grants, correct? Yes, it needs to be incorporated. Um, I'm not exactly sure how the word consent is used in this context, and that might be a discussion where we'd want to call in Charles Ducker um, at the um, office of um, uh, our IP lawyer. Um, sorry, mm -hmm. OCG, right? Um, or oh, OGC, oh, Office of General Counsel. There I go. Um, Acronym. Right. Um, but um, yeah, uh, it, that one might be. Um, and because every OA, every mode has slightly different contract language um, and uses different words differently, we might wanna call them in and make sure we get that ironed out. But yes, it needs to be in the contract and grant language. And there is specific language for that. And it came out in 2016 and it was in dot dash 2016.03 and dot dash 2016.05. 
which I have, and we have those linked up on our SharePoint site so folks can get those. Um, but in case you don't already have that language in your contract. I think that was another question, which I think you just answered. Um, uh, when you refer to privacy concerns as a restriction, what does that actually mean? Do you need to include a statement when you're going to the IRB that states anonymous data set will be shared due to this public law? So, so how does that play out when, when there could be privacy concerns? Yes, so it depends obviously on the type of research, but um, if it's the type of research where you're using human subjects and you would go to get IRB approval um, at the beginning, you wanna make sure that your um, documents, the proposals, whatever you're sending to the IRB includes the DOT public access plan and that you're including for a, that you're planning for a publicly shareable anonymized data set. So that means um, you may have to plan at the very earliest stages. All right, so our public release data is gonna have these age buckets, right? So we anonymize folks and we're gonna give each human subject um, a random identifier so that their names can't be um, found that we're using um, zip codes rather than um, census block numbers so that folks can't be located um, depending on where they live. So there's a lot of considerations that go into that if you're doing human subjects. And again, we go back to the 100 car naturalistic driving. There's pictures of people's faces while they're driving and they're being human and they're doing human things like putting on their lipstick or picking their nose or, do, or drinking their coffee and spilling their coffee in their lap. All of those things, right? Um, and it would be embarrassing if that video got out, right? So we protect those people by keeping that data locked at Virginia Tech and only um, registered researchers get to come in and use it and they can't take screenshots and other things that show people's faces or we use special video technology to anonymize the faces, thing, you know, things like that. So um, yes, this, is, this privacy issue has to be addressed very early. Um, you might also think a bit um, on, in terms of uh, business uh, intellectual property. Um, if you're using um, data that you're buying from, say you're buying data from Waze, right? Um, to use in your own DOT um, funded research project, you need to check that um, contract and what that use is, right? You, you may not be able to use the Waze data um, and give it back to the public, um, or you may have to figure out some way to um, anonymize or create a, a public use set out of that based in conversation with ways, right? So there's lots to be thinking about on privacy and intellectual property. Excellent. Um, I'll, I'll ask one more question and let you go on uh, and we'll, we'll hit the rest of them in the next round. Um, does the DOT have any generic language that can be used as a template when you're submitting a manuscript to a journal or a conference? Oh, have we developed that yet? Um, that's going to be a question for Charles. We should try to get something um, that helps everybody out. Um, and we should put that into our implementation um, website as we move forward. Um, and that's that's going to be one of the one of the um, projects we were doing this year. Now that the plan is being written and will be submitted um, for approval um, over the summer, we need to start working on the guidance documentation. So that's a great one. Um, to flag and try to remember because we get this question a lot or something similar to this question. We get that a lot. Okay. Sorry, I don't have an answer, folks. Okay, we can go on and we'll, we'll hit, there's more questions, we'll, we'll hit them later. And by the way, if anybody, if we don't get to your questions, we'll, we'll try to handle them offline and email afterwards. Excellent. So, okay, so the next section we're gonna jump into is section seven is implementation. And this one is pretty dense. And so we're going to take our time with it. This is this is the big one. This is the one with all the teeth, right? This is, and this is the one that's giving us the most fits and, and trouble. Um, so uh, we're going to spend a little bit of time on it. I'm going to focus on these four areas: um, what you do before research begins, data submissions, data management, and data preservation. So, um, and we'll we'll go into some depth on each of those. So um, here we go. Um, on what to do before research begins. So this step happily is mostly accomplished, right? The things you see up there on the screen, DOT was gonna do all those things back, beginning back in 2015. We've done most of these things, right? There's the language in the dot dashes there that you can put into your contracts. We 
have an agreement with data site and the Department of Energy to mint digital object identifiers that we can put on publications and data sets. And NTL does that on behalf right now of the DOT. Um, we do, our public access plan does require researchers to get an open researcher and contributor ID or an ORCID. I have one. If you go back to the title slide, you'll see my ORCID. You can go visit my page in ORCID and you can see all the things that I do, all the things I've published, all the presentations I've given, not all of them because I haven't completely updated that yet. But, um, and that's important um, because at some point we will be able to automatically allow the software and the machines and the databases to ID a researcher who's doing DOT research based on their ORCID, go into our database and send their funded project information back to their ORCID profile so that when they go to get a tenure review, they can open up their uh, ORCID profile and they can show the tenure review committee, look, here's all the DOT projects that I've got funded and they came automatically right into my profile. Um, and public publishers are doing the same thing. They're linking um, automatically through our ORCID um, publications that we um, uh, author or in my case, um, peer reviews that I do. I got credit from Transportation Research Board um, on my ORCID profile because I'm a peer reviewer. So ORCIDs are a good thing. We can talk more about those in depth another time. And finally, we do require that researchers include the funding agreement numbers on submissions of research results. They fail at this over and over and over again. I can't tell you how many reports we get that don't have contract numbers or other funding numbers on them. It's a huge frustration for us because right now we do not have the facility to link up a final report with the research project where it started. Um, all the things that are supposed to happen break. Um, titles change, numbers don't get included, um, staff changes, um, what have you. So that's the hardest part for us. We can't give those sorts of metrics and we wish we could. Um, so that's good news. Let's move on to the next part of implementation. Most of these are in process. They're not perfect, but they're, they're moving. That's good. Um, so data submission. Um, you can see here that, um, you know, for those of us here at DOT, we need to make sure we un read and understand OMB M1313 and DOT order 1351.34 on the data release policy because that informs everything that we do. Um, for our extramural and our intramural researchers, we have developed a data management plan template and standardized requirements for data management plans. In fact, um, DOT and myself as the representative are part of a federal subcommittee of, on open science through the Office of Science and Technology Policy um, at the White House, who have set new standards harmonizing federal DMP. So with the release of the new um, public access plan later this summer, you'll also see slightly modified data management plan sections, but what they will generally agree across the entire federal government. For those people who get funded by more than one agency, they're going to say hallelujah. Um, so um, that's good news. Th again, those are things that are mostly accomplished. That's, that's good for us on, on implementation. Again, we've developed these policies and these tools, but then having them implemented on the ground, again, is the hard part. That takes a lot of training, a lot of education. Data management, here's the big one. Um, and um, I was talking with Anthony beforehand um, and DMPs confuse people and DMPs shouldn't confuse people. Data management plans are basic knowledge management plans for a research team. This is how you as the principal investigator communicate with everybody else on your research team, including the lowliest grad student who is maybe doing your basic um, data crunching, what the expectations are, how the data is gonna be managed, what file formats, what size we're expecting and what repository it's gonna live in um, and how we're gonna handle our files. And if there's privacy concerns, this is basic knowledge management. This way you don't have to repeat yourself over and over again. Data management plans can help you through the data life cycle if you embrace them. Um, and I've already agreed in principle to do a whole workshop on DMPs um, at some point later in the summer. So, um, and I'd love to spend time and love to talk about this. Um, the DMP, our DMP um, template currently has six sections. I forgot to put one up here. Um, the new one, when, it's, when we get the harmonized federal template in place, we'll have seven short sections, but all of these short sections can be done. I promise you they can be done at the proposal level in two to three pages. That's what we get, we get lots of those. And in fact, um, not only do we have 
links here um, to help you see the templates on, for seeing uh, creating DMPs. But over in that left hand box, you see that header that says Rosa P DMP collection. There's actually a collection in our repository in Rosa P of just data management plans. Most of these are from UTC research centers, and most of these are three to six pages. If they're six pages, it's because they put a pretty cover on it and done some other things, which I've asked them to do to make it easier to identify. Um, but data management planning is not hard and it's essential for knowledge management. So I encourage folks to um, start to embrace that and I, I will help you embrace that. And then the other thing about data management is the repository that you put the data in should meet certain requirements. It should take um, certain steps in order to preserve the data for the long term so that we as the federal government and the taxpaying people can trust that the data will be there when we want to get to it. And there's guidelines on that too. Um, and you can see the, D, the DOI there at the bottom of the screen. So where are we going next? Um, ah, another question, another question that got sent in. Okay, what are the metadata standards um, requirements and resources available? Thank you for this very easy question to answer. Um, appreciate that. The DOT public access plan specifies project open data metadata schema, which is now known as DCAT US. And you can see the link there on the screen. It changed name over the course of the last five years. It's the exact same JSON schema. Data sets should be accompanied by a JSON metadata file and templates for those JSON DCAT US files can be found at resources.data.gov. Um, and there's the, uh, the field mapping link. Other federal data and metadata tools and training, again, you can go to resources.gov and it's, it's there. The, um, who runs this? Um, OMB runs this website and they've put it all together and Phil Ashlock there, um, who I run into at other meetings and conferences has done a very good job of putting all those resources there for you to use. So I encourage you to use them, but I can also help you with that. Um, spend some time with that, um, especially the tools for validating your JSON file so that it comes out right. Um, and gets read very easily by data.gov because that's essentially what, who we're writing this JSON file for is that government search engine data.gov, which is the overall inventory of all US government data. That's, that's our immediate audience for these metadata files. Okay, so um, section 7.6.2, data preservation. So some of the things that DOT has started but hasn't finished yet, expanding, um, the National Transportation Library Repository to meet trusted digital repository requirements. This is not trivial. <laughs> We're still not there yet on the technological end or on the documentation end. Most of getting trusted status is about documenting your workflows and your processes. We still have a little, little bit of ways to go on that. And then there's a few technological things that with our new repository software that we hope to roll out somewhere in the next year, um, we hope we'll solve some of those issues too, so we can actually get trustworthy status because Mary and I lose sleep over the fact that we haven't gotten um, our trusted status yet because it's something we really want for our repository because we take um, the role as the DOT's central repository very seriously and we want that because that lets other researchers and other around the world know that they can trust the quality and authenticity of the data that they're getting from DOT, right? So it's, it's another important step. Um, we are engaged in digital preservation networks wherever we can, and we um, have taken up all of these best practices um, to ensure long-term access of digital data sets. And to be honest, um, most of these practices were already in place at DOT when the policy was written back in 2015 at NTL, um, and um, we haven't had to add too many new things, but there are still places we want to stretch for, including with trusted status. Um, and again, we will take into account the relative value long for long-term preservation of data sets. Um, so at some point, my job as a, as a data curator, one of the things I'm hired to do actually is to do that sort of assessment over the lifetime of data to decide, yeah, this, this isn't actually useful um, and we could afford to free up the storage or we can stick it in cold storage, um, take it off of our warm storage um, platform, put it in cold storage and only access and only have access to it um, through mediated access where you call us and we send you the data set rather than it being available for download all the time. There's, there's steps we can take and there are people who are trained to do that. I happen to be one of them. So, um, and this raised another question um, brought in by one of you all at FAA. 
what plans are in place for digital data to preserve it long term because all digital hardware does expire at some point. Yes, obsolescence is a thing. Hardware and software obsolescence is a thing. And if you go and you read my master's thesis from graduate school, it's all about the obsolescence of um, the beige Macs, Apple Macintosh computers from back in the 90s and the software known as HyperCard. Oh, be, be still my heart. So um, public access plan requires digital data sets be shared in open file formats, ubiquitous file formats whenever possible, such as um, comma separated value. So if you've got tabular data, um, you shouldn't just store it in an Excel spreadsheet. It should be stored in a, in a CSV. Um, these open file formats are ubiquitous, long lived, and less prone to software or hardware obsolescence issues. You may not think this, but Microsoft could actually go out of business and take its code around Excel with it. And then what would we do if we use spreadsheets, right? Um, so we'd have to find something else. We would have to find an open source um, software for that instead. So whenever possible, NTL works with researchers to migrate data into open preservation friendly formats at the time of submission or at the time of gathering. We'll do some education and hope you, you gather it in an open format. And if not possible, we will migrate data from old formats to new formats um, using archival best practices. Um, sometimes that means opening up you know, um, a database program to migrate data. Um, um, sometimes that means sucking data sets out of PDFs because they're prisoner in PDF. Um, and my colleague, Jesse Long, who's the fellow, the data curation fellow at NTL is on the call today. She knows all about um, that kind of activity. So one of the other things I, I mentioned, I am the chair of the Public Access Implementation Working Group. This is a group of 60 of your colleagues around DOT, many of them at headquarters, some not, um, who are doing our best now to put more effort into implementation of the Public Access Plan. Um, I am always looking for new people who are interested in public access, who wanna be a part of that group. Um, some of the folks are volunteers, some of the folks are voluntold. I'm looking for interested volunteers, people who really want to take this seriously. Um, there's task forces um, that folks can chair, there's actions that folks can be a part of. We had a great lively group last year drafting the um, proposed changes to the uh, DOT public access plan. Very dynamic, lots of fun. Mary chairs the group on publications and publication sharing. So there's lots of great opening um, for folks if they want to come be a part of that. And this is your invitation to come be a part of that because you just want to spend more time with me and Mary. Um, last bit on this section before we take another question break, and probably our last question break of, of, of the day, um, is timeline. Um, and this relates to a question that, that we'll get to in a second. So as you can see on the slide, this plan has been in the works. It started in the works in 2013 and has floated around DOT and went to all the OAs and, and, and got approval and all that, and was approved by senior leadership um, in October of 2015 and was published and effective December 31st, 2015. And you're asking yourself, why didn't I hear about it? And you're asking yourself, why do I hear Layton's cat? Give me a second. The beauty of working from home, folks. Gotta love it. So, hey, hi, Joey. Hi, Joey. We <laughs> at, are least, now... at, least, at least it, it didn't uh, replace your face with a cat, right? <laughs> <laughs> I am not a cat, Judge. I am not a cat. Um, so we're five and a half years beyond the implementation date of this plan, right? And we're still giving presentations to folks like this is new information. And the big reason for that is until very recently, to be honest, and I'm never afraid to say this to anybody who's listening, up to this point or up to 2020, DOT just did not invest the resources in full implementation of the public access plan. I was the only DOT person hired to focus on public access and other folks like Mary and other folks in OSTR, it was added to their work plans, um, sometimes um, so sort of ad, in an ad hoc way. Um, so there's a reason we're not as far along as we should be, but I believe we're turning that corner and we're gonna see much more implementation. So the question was, here it is, what's the timeline? So FAA should have already been providing public access to data sets beginning January 1, 2016. You're not, that's okay. Realistically, I'm not here to, to spank you all for not having done this for the last five and a half years. What I am suggesting is that FAA um, and the research units prepare to begin full implementation starting January 1, 2022, or some other date soon after, right? Let's set a date, let's work together where, and me as chair of, as of POG can work with you to help you with that, um, set that date and start working on implementation. And, I promise you that if you get called in by your leadership to say, 
Um, when are we going to start implementing? And you say, well, Leighton said we could set a date. I will stand up and back that up. I'm saying it now on recorded video. I will come to your meeting and say, yes, I am not going to make you go back and do legacy work. Legacy work is stupid and has low return on investment. Um, that's my reminder to stop. Um, we're going to do our best moving forward. We're going to pick a date. And we're going to go forward unless there are specific projects from the last five and a half years that you really want to make sure that you save the data for, then I will work with you to help save, um, preserve those data and share them with the public. Um, last question, what about software and code? Yes, software and code is coming in the new plan. Um, how many minutes do I have? Um, so yes, the other part of this question is um, it will be covered the same as data. In, in, the, in the new public access plan. And the person who asked the question said, well, what if people use it in ways that aren't intended? Listen, <laughs> the reality is all of our research is public domain. The public has the right to it. It's not copyrightable. We put things out there and the public uses it in ways we didn't intend from the beginning. Even things that would seem factual like statistics, right? People use in ways that we don't intend. And there's nothing we can do about that. It's part of the risk of government putting out data and research. We just have to accept that. Again, caveated with, unless it violates or puts into danger privacy, business IP, or homeland and national security, right? So we have some covers here that we need to think through um, if, we're, if we're really concerned. So that brings us to the next question break, but basically, um, Mike, what I'm gonna say is since we've only got a few minutes left, let's make this the last question break. Let's make this the end of the presentation. Um, because as I said before, there's more here than we have time for, and I'm happy to come back and do more. I, I agree. There is a few questions that we may not get to. That's okay. We'll, we'll handle them in email afterwards. Uh, everybody that logged in, I have your email. We'll, we'll send it out to everybody, those responses. Um, in terms of, uh, I want to thank you, Leighton, for, for such an informative uh, briefing, as well as the reference material that you provided here which we have plenty of reading material to go look at and, and uh, the links to the plan. Uh, and uh, I'm sure we can follow up with additional questions if we have them in the future. And uh, you were graciously offered to come back. And so um, I'm sure uh, Dr. Trevianis and I will, will, will think up some good ideas there <laughs> and, and talk to you about that. Uh, Anthony, do you wanna make any uh, closing remarks? Uh, yeah, I want to thank you very much for your time, uh, as well as your advanced uh, agreement to revisit us on this topic. I fully uh, support uh, the initiative and, and where it's going. Um, and as we kind of talked offline, um, part of my dissertation was clean from um, U.S. government data that was available that was reanalyzed for a totally different purpose from which it was ever originally collect collected. So there is a lot of value here. Um, and so, uh, yeah, this is this is where we need to go. Fully support. Very much look forward to you helping us with the data management plans in the future. Thank you. Happy to do it. Yeah, a lot of material to digest, and and thanks also for uh, you know reading in those questions that we had sent prior to. I think that they were very helpful to to dig into. That was, yeah, that was a big help to me, and I encourage you know folks who want to send in more questions. Happy to follow up. We can do we can do a follow up brown bag lunch sort of thing, where it's just discussion about the questions. It doesn't have to be a formal presentation. There's all sorts of things that I'm available to do because DOT actually pays me to do this as part of my job. So I am available to you because I am paid to do this. So don't not take advantage of that. We will. We definitely will. And we already have and we'll continue to do that. And I, I, I know we're going to be bringing you back on some, some, some ideas, maybe workshop, brown bag. We'll, we'll think of some, some good, good ways. But with that, we we're one minute short of two o'clock. So uh, I'm always uh, happy to give people time back. Thanks everybody for attending and uh, uh, more to come. Bye everybody. Ladies, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the deep dive into public data access. We thank you for attending and please have a wonderful rest of your day.